You don't know Japanese? It's all right. Keep on. Ue wo mu uite. No, you have to repeat after me. Ue wo mu uite. So, so, look at this guy, okay? Aru ko wo wo wo. Just walk, okay? <laughs> Look at and then just walk. It's simple, but when we this song was back 1963 in the United States of America in a Billboard number one hit. So if you don't know, you are too young. <laughs>
anniversary of the Manzanar pilgrimage. Let's please acknowledge the banner procession, all of the folks carrying these banners. UCLA Kyoto Taiko and Ken Koshio. Let us also acknowledge everybody here who is an actual survivor of Manzanar or any of the concentration camps or detention centers. If you could just raise your hand. It's really hot. You don't have to stand. And show of hands if you are a descendant of anybody who was put into an American concentration camp during World War II, detention centers, federal prisons. And everyone who is here today to acknowledge that this is actually all of our story. It is an American story. It is a human story. Everyone who is here today for that. Everyone who is here today is a descendant of our story, our shared history. Yes? Welcome. Uh, thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> One more time for the banner procession. Thank you. <laughs> Remembering all of our camps. It is a true honor to be here today. My name is Tracy Katokidiyama. I am with a few projects, project, uh, Pull Project, Tuesday Night Project, and Vigilant Love. The Vigilant Love crew, we actually brought two buses today. Right. Yeah, you'll see us in these shirts. Um, it's an honor to share this stage with uh, our hero and a longtime OG in the community and uh, my co-MC for today. We are going to, in the tradition of all the previous pilgrimages, you will see that we will have things like the taiko, things like Ken singing, things like the banner procession, um, all of us sitting out here bearing the heat together. Uh, please stay hydrated. Don't be afraid of using the porta potties. Just drink as much water as you can. We don't want anybody fainting. But that's part of the tradition is to really be here to share a day, to share a moment um, together. And to help us keep that moving along, I want to also just point out our big sisters, Carrie and Kimi and June, who are going to help us keep time right under there. So all the speakers, can, you'll see your one minute and your wrap. Can you, can you raise your hands, big sisters? Yeah. So they're going to keep us moving forward. And on that note, um, I want to just introduce to the mic now uh, a former California State Assemblyman, uh, somebody who has represented us in the college, uh, community college system and the Los Angeles Unified School System. And really, more importantly than anything, I think, is one of the first people to come out here and do exploratory visits to Banzanar even before pilgrimage began. Somebody who has really impressed upon so many of us from younger generations to really look back in order to move forward. So let's give it up for Warren Budutani. Thank you very much, Tracy. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me clarify something, what OG stands for, if you don't know. Some people think it stands for OG-san. <laughs> Well, it's really original gangster. That means we were here from the beginning. I gotta tell you folks, that from this vantage point, looking out at all of you standing here for the 50th anniversary of the Manzanar pilgrimage, it's stunning. It's stunning. The only thing that is more dramatic than seeing all of your beautiful four faces here is to look out on the Sierra Nevada mountains. And that's what happened the first time Victor Shibata and I came to Manzanar. You know, we almost called this the Manzanar March, not the Manzanar Pilgrimage. What happened was that there was a Poor People's March in Washington where Reverend King and Reverend Afranathi connected the civil rights with the Poor People's Campaign. There was a march by the farm workers with C.J. Chavez and Dolores Huerta, Philip Vera Cruz, and the other Monongs like Hilary Leong had marched to Sacramento, the capital, to talk about the issues for the workers in the fields. So Victor and I were coming back from an anti-war demonstration, and we were saying, doggone it, we got to march somewhere. 
And we had heard through the grapevine, because we were both born post-war, that there was this place called Manslaughter. There was these things called camp that every one of our Japanese American families talked about, usually in hushed tones, but it was a touchstone, a reference point, where within a conversation, quickly, it would get to, were you in camp? What camp were you in? Did you know such and such a family? So when we talked about doing this Manslaughter March, we knew a little bit about Manslaughter being the closest one to Los Angeles, so we thought we would march from Los Angeles to Manslaughter. <laughs> we didn't have Google Maps in those days, so we put out the map, and you know, half an inch equaled 100 miles, and we said, damn, we can't do that. <laughs> so then we thought we'd march from the San Fernando, no, that doesn't work either. So it started where we would park by the, at that time, an abandoned gymnasium, which housed the DWP work trucks, and we would march from there. But Victor said, wait a minute, the first time we got here, we were driving up this road, covered with sagebrush, tumbleweed, and overgrowth, and undergrowth, and you could see the Sierra Nevadas in the background and the sloping Upper Owens Valley. And out of this landscape jutted up this obelisk. All geometric straight lines, white, with some remnants of black print on it, which we could understand was kanji. So that drew us to this place. And we figured Manson on Mark sounded too much like a John Philip Sousa song. Yeah. And Victor hit the nail right on the head. He said, Warren, this is a sacred place. I welcome all of you today to this sacred place to return back, to pay our respects, and to learn from history, but not only from history, but knowing that history's lessons are as applicable as ever today. So that's when it became the Manson Art Pilgrimage. And not to belabor this, but to give credit to two individuals we came up here in December, that's how ignorant, not stupid, but ignorant. We just didn't know better. We came in December between Christmas and New Year's. You do not come to the Upper Owens Valley. <laughs> Kathleen, I'm telling you, Kathy, you don't come up here. In the end of December, it was so cold. Talk about fainting, it wasn't because of the heat, it was because of the cold. And then when we went back, we had heard on the community grapevine that two ministers, Reverend Rockahiro and Reverend Maeda, lay ministers, one Buddhist and one Christian, had been coming back to the camp ever since the camp closed. And that was in the springtime because they knew they knew what they were what they were doing. So ever since then in 1970, we came back in the spring. And the reason it's the last Saturday on April is because that's opening day for trout fishing. So we figured we'd get some Buddha head fishermen at least to come to the pilgrimage. But they started the first man's in our pilgrimage and the reason was that although the government said that all the bodies in the cemetery are exhumed, Reverend Wakahiro and Reverend Maeda confided in us and said there are still bodies in the cemetery. That's why ever since then, the remaining 50 pilgrimages that we have been a part of, the 75 pilgrimages they were a part of, you focus on the religious ceremony at the cemetery because we're here to pay homage and pay our respects to those that are still here. So someone that understands this valley far better than I do, Someone that understands this valley because she was born here, and although she has a great title, she's straight up an activist. That's what she is. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce to you Kathy Jefferson Bancroft, who is the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, that sounds pretty good, right? Of the Lone Pine Paiute Shoshone Reservation. Kathy. Um, I really want to welcome all of you to our tr the traditional homeland of the Nuu and Numu people who um, we call this place Payahunado, which means the place where the water always flows. My family's lived in this valley for thousands of years, thousands of years, and um, we learned how to take care of it, we learned to respect it, and we have deep ties to this valley even today. 
I know that a lot of you also have deep ties and good and bad memories of this place. Um, it's really an honor to be invited to come and talk to you guys, and, and it's really nice to come meet with you all. Uh, there's a... Uh, we, we work hard, the tribal people, to preserve this land and teach other people to respect it. But I didn't realize how many other people cared when we were facing a big solar project right across the valley here. And when the Manson Art Committee stepped in, they started listening because we were all banding together. And um, it was really nice to get to meet and know other people who cared as much as, about this valley as we did. Uh, you talk about this being a sacred place. This is a very sacred place and we have great respect for it. We consider this whole valley a sacred place and we appreciate the respect that you guys have for this place. Um, I just want to say thank you for all coming and um, remember it takes all of us. We got a lot trying to uh, disturb our sites and everything up here. It's going to take all of us to get together and let them know that we care and we uh, are going to defend this place. So thank you. Can we get one of our stage folks to help us out on the steps here? Thank you. You know, when we first started Man's in Our Pilgrimage and we came up here, inadvertently you started to learn about the issues of the valley. One of them that I'm sure everybody knows is water, is water. So when we started our first pilgrimages, we wanted to be able to use this land without getting any trouble. And we looked through the government processes, who's what and where, and we found out that who controlled this land at the time was the Department of Water of Power of Los Angeles. <laughs> so those of us in Los Angeles, some of our water comes from this valley. And just driving up with my son and my granddaughter and my wife, we were thinking, what would this valley look like if there wasn't the aqueduct taking the water out? But that's a whole other story. Through that, we were able to make some really good friends at the California state level and now at the national level. I'd like to introduce someone that we've been working with, Bernadette Johnson. She's the superintendent of the Banstar National Historic Site. They're the ones that have been helping out with all of this development. Really appreciate their help and their work and their leadership, Bernadette. amazing to see all of your faces here. So imagine this landscape with 10,000 people. Next year we should make 10,000 people come, so it feels like 1942. Uh, but on behalf of the National Park Service, I just want to welcome you. Uh, thank you for always sharing your stories with us. Thank you for being here for us because without you and your stories, the 104,000 people that visited Manzanar last year would have a different experience when they come to Manzanar. So know that for those of you who were incarcerated, even if it wasn't Manzanar, your experience and your stories are still being preserved here. And people of all colors from all across the world are learning about the injustice that you and your families endured during incarceration. Kathy talked about the Paiute use of our valley. Um, and earlier, I think Warren talked about the Sierra Nevada. And here's one thing I think about how visitors experience this site. A year and a half ago in our new classroom exhibit, a visitor left a line drawing of the Sierra and it simply said this, the Sierra stands as a silent witness. So today, the Sierra is witnessing all of you coming together on this hallowed ground, this very special place 
where we can all remember what happened and make sure that we influence other people to make sure it doesn't happen again. So thank you and have a very safe day. didn't do my job. Um, so let me come back. Um, so on behalf of the National Park Service, we have our Acting Deputy Regional Director for the Pacific West Region, or Region 10. Um, and she'll be giving you a few brief remarks, but please welcome Cindy Orlando. Mahalo Bernadette. Let me just ditto Bernadette on behalf of the National Park Service. I want to welcome you as we mark the 50th anniversary of the pilgrimage. It is truly amazing to see all of these faces here with us. Thank you very much for being with us today. And thank you especially to the Manzanar Committee. Amazing work that you do. All the volunteers that make this possible. And to Bernadette and her staff, the incredible hospitality and keeping us all safe today. When Congress created Manzanar National Historic Site almost 30 years ago, it was the culmination of more than two decades of very passionate work by very dedicated people. And now we have this place and others across the country that will forever stand as reminders of the injustices suffered by so many people. The stories of Japanese Americans and immigrants of Japanese ancestry are featured at Manzanar, Minidoka and Honouli Uli National Historic Sites, the newly created Tule Lake National Monument, and the Bainbridge Island Japanese American Exclusion Memorial, among others. At many sites, preservation began with grassroots effort to bring recognition to these stories. What begins with the efforts of a few becomes a legacy for all of us. Before taking my current position, I was the superintendent of Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. The lei that I am wearing today is a kumihimo lei and reflects the traditional art of Japanese braiding. It was, I was gifted this lei by Betsy Young of the Japanese Cultural Center in Honolulu, who all send their aloha to you. One of my responsibilities at the park was to preserve the buildings used as a detainment center within Kilauea military camp within the park boundary. In less than four hours after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Territorial Governor Joseph Poindexter invoked the Hawaii Defense Act, giving him absolute wartime power in Hawaii. By mid-afternoon, the decision to place the territory under martial law was made placing control of Hawaii under a military governor. On the evening of December 7, 1941, the usually sleepy military facility became a detainment camp, eventually holding more than 100 resident Japanese. Later, it also held Koreans and Italians. Those who had been arrested by nightfall had previously been identified and named on the FBI's custodial detention list. These detainees were just a few of what amounted to 2,000 people from Hawaii, a third of whom were American citizens at the time, who were incarcerated. Mr. Yoshio Hoshida, otherwise known to us as George, a detainee at KMC, preserved the experiences with letters and incredible artwork. Like so many others at the sites listed above, his depictions tell the stories of the forced re relocation and incarceration of up to 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry, one of the most atrocious civil rights abuses in the 20th century. Those depictions are our stories. Here at Manzanar, Sansei Warren Furutani and Victor Shibata organized the first public pilgrimage as we heard about in 1969. Nisei led the fight to recognize and preserve the, fight, the site. Under the determined leadership of Sue Kunitomi Embry, the Manzanar Committee overcame challenges to obtain the state landmark designation in 1972, which led to the historic landmark designation in 1985. You know the rest of the story. 
Last year, as Bernadette said, over 104,000 people visited the site. The power of the place is helping to change hearts and minds. We in the National Park Service are humbled by the responsibility to steward and preserve these very important experiences and stories for all of you. And so that visitors from around the world can learn about the Japanese incarceration and to remind each of us to work together to make sure this never happens again. Have a wonderful day and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernadette. You know, the music you heard, and let's give another round of applause for Kiro Taiko and Ken Hoshio and his son. You know, I think it was last weekend we had Coachella. As OGs remember Woodstock, okay, Woodstock. Well, this is Manzanar in the desert, so if you want to come hear some good music, this is the place to come. And if we were to have a music festival here in Manzanar, you know who would headline that? Tracy Kiriyama. She's a performer, she's a writer. She is the one that started Tuesday Night Cafe, a performing speaking program that has been going on for 18, almost 20 years. So let's bring Tracy back up here for the next part of the program. Tracy. Warren. Uh, how's everybody doing? Staying cool? All right. Let's take a swig of water together. All right. Okay, we have to pace ourselves. Um, I'm going to be introducing the next two speakers. This next person uh, is, is newer to us and we're looking forward to hearing his remarks. Um, I was raised by a community of elders, including Warren, who really uh, had me understand the importance of bridging, bridging across communities. And uh, we are always interested to know that we have partners that extend as far as Japan when we're looking at how we're fighting injustice and how we're bringing people together, and how we're acknowledging our past and moving forward together. So we're really excited to have the new Consulate General of Japan from San Francisco. Please welcome Consul General Tomochika Uyama. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Konnichiwa. My name is Tomochika Uyama, Consul General of Japan in San Francisco. Uh, I may be relatively new, but I'm in San Francisco almost one year. But uh, I'm very humbled to join you today for the 50th Manzanar pilgrimage. I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to the Manzanar Committee for inviting my wife Keiko and myself to be a part of this important event and on such important anniversary occasion. I heard about Manzanar. I really wanted to come to here, and I'm happy that I'm here today. And thank you to all of you for making the time to come out here. It is truly a meaningful thing to commemorate this historic history together, and it is only possible because you value the importance of that enough to be here. Maybe I was asked to say a little bit in Japanese, so switch to Japanese. Zai San Francisco, Nihon Kok Soryoji no Uyama to Moshimas. Honjitsua, Dai Goju Kaime no Kinen Subeki, Manzanar Junre ni Kanai to Tomoni, Mata Honeoni, Ok no Minasamaka to Tomoni, Sanka Deki, Taihen ni Reshiku, Omimas, Domo Ariato Gozaimas. Back to English. <laughs> With this visit, I have now joined uh, pilgrimages to both camps in California, having gone last year to Tule Lake. While my knowledge is certain deeper this second time, it is no easier the second time seeing the site with my own eyes and coming to terms with injustice that occurred here. I came here today with members of the Japanese Chamber of Commerce of Northern California 
made up of mostly Japanese business, business leaders and their family members who are committed to educating themselves and their com communities about this uh, key moment in history and apply its lessons to the modern generation. I understand that uh, here we have so many people, Japanese people, Japanese American, and the friends and others from various places who have come with the same spirit. I hope that we can encourage more to visit here and learn their important lessons. On behalf of the government and people of Japan, I'd like to express my heartfelt sympathies and appreciation to the people who endured those experiences. We cannot undo the injustices, but at the very least, we can remember them and honor these memories by building better societies today. Thank you very much once again for giving me this opportunity to speak today. I wish everyone a very successful and meaningful pilgrimage. Thank you very much. A quick acknowledgement. We have a lot of friends in a lot of different places. Uh, we don't know what elected officials are here this afternoon, so we're not going to bother introducing everybody. But we want to acknowledge, too, the presented state resolutions in the assembly uh, this year. And one is from this district, and that's Assemblyman Mathis. Is his representative here? Assembly Mathis, representative? If you could, there he is. Thank you very much. Please convey our appreciation to the assembly member and also the only Japanese American assembly person and legislator in the state of California, and that's Al Morisuchi. He also presented a resolution. So let me turn this back to Tracy. All right. So I just want to acknowledge how beautiful it actually was to just hear Japanese being spoken here. Um, we were reminded in our bus ride up here by one of our big sisters, Mia Yamamoto, how the Issei, the first generation, really suffered a lot and were really truly marginalized from their own sense of self, their own sense of dignity, their own language, their own cultural practices. Um, I know that I have people in my family that did not want to speak Japanese or study it ever again. There's a reason why I, as a younger sensei, don't know Japanese, right? And I think it is directly tied to that. So I, I love and appreciate all the language and invite all of it. So please keep that coming. Another thing that we held space for on our bus right here, one of our big sisters, Kathy Masaoka, reminded us of our partnerships beyond the Japanese American community. And it is such an honor to bring up CARE. Their tagline is the nation's largest civil rights advocacy group for American Muslims. And we in the Japanese American community have a particular honor of knowing this partnership. Uh, from early on, after 9-11, CARE organized buses to come to this pilgrimage and has done so every year. And we have built programs together. We are so inspired by them. So we're so excited that three folks are here to speak today. I would love to acknowledge Rula Alush. Rula is the chair of the national board. Nihad Awad is the executive director and co-founder. And Hassam Elush, CARE California Los Angeles executive director. Let's give them all a huge hand. Peace be with all of you. It's a tremendous honor to be here with you all, and I want to thank you for permitting us the privilege of sharing this sacred space with each of you. And thank you to our Japanese American brothers and sisters who have stood in solidarity with the American Muslim community for years and years. I personally believe that witnessing this part of our nation's history should be a rite of passage for all Americans. It serves as a reminder to each of us that issues of human rights and human dignity are intersectional. I'm reminded today of an experience I had during the 2016 presidential campaign. I had the honor of serving on a panel 
with a man who had been incarcerated in a, in a Japanese internment camp. And of the different experiences he shared, the one that stayed with me the most was his reflection and recollection of the number that he and his family had been reduced to. He was a six-year-old child when he was assigned that number, as a, and as a man in his 80s, he could share it easily. And I was struck, and I've continued to remember that moment as a reminder to myself and each of us that we each have to do everything that we can to ensure that no one in our country is ever reduced to a number again. Oh. Peace and love to each of you. Thank you. My name is Nihad Awad. I'm the co-founder of CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations. When my children were young, we were trying to teach them about American history. We gifted our children three books about the mass incarceration and Manzanar in specific. My daughter read all of these books when she was 10 years old. On 9-11, when 9-11 happened, and we have seen the anti-Muslim propaganda in the media, blaming Islam and the entire Muslim community for the terrorist attacks, similar to the blame that was leveled against the Japanese-American community when Pearl Harbor happened. Feeling that what happened to Japanese-Americans may happen to her and to her brothers, she packed her suitcase and she was ready to be picked up by the federal government. She told us this a few days after 9-11. I and CARE, CARE team, and national and local civil rights organizations are working hard every day to assure her that this will never happen to her or any children in America. And that, and that is a commitment in memory of those people who suffered more than four years of being incarcerated here against their will just because of their skin color and because of their racial background. <laughs> this white supremacy then is creeping back into our politics today and we as Americans have to stand united against any suggestion of Muslim registry or Muslim ban or Muslim discrimination or against racial profiling against African Americans or not giving or allowing Native Americans access to their lands and natural resources or any separation of children from their parents. An attack on one community is an attack on all of us. This should be our commitment and if we believe in this, if we love those people who spend years and here, we should act as one community against injustice. Thank you. I also start and begin with Assalamu Alaikum, which means peace with, with you all. My name is Hussam Ayrouj, and I'm the Executive Director of the Southern California or Greater Los Angeles Area Office of CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations. For almost 15 years, every year, we've had the privilege and the honor of bringing in the Muslim community, the leadership, the youth, the activists from all over California, five, six buses every year, coming here to get the honor of being here with you. This year, we are honored to be joined by actually care leaders from all over the country, joining us because they wanted to be part of this moment, especially as we commemorate this 50th, 50th anniversary of this pilgrimage. The reason we come here truly is to say thank you. Thank you to the Japanese American community. You've been true brothers and sisters to us. Your resilience, your love, your courage, your embracing of the Muslim community had been phenomenal, unparalleled. Our very first call, I remember when I was at the care office, my very first call received right after 9-11 from, from, from was from a Japanese American friend, unfortunately telling me, prepare yourself and your community. I didn't imagine what will happen. And since then we've been honored building these bridges together. So thank you for this friendship. Thank you for being true partners. The second reason, as I've come several times and have brought my children here, is because truly 
this had been the time when they felt the need and the importance of being united as a community, the importance of civil rights, and your resilience, your presence has made that possible. Thank you for that. And you know what? Almost 75 years since that shameful moment in our history, we still have to deal with camps in our country today where migrant children are separated from their parents placed in camps. When we say never again, let's make sure it never happens again. Thank you for being here, and I look forward to continuing this partnership. Let me also thank Tracy and an organization she works with, Vigilant in Love, the National Council of Redress and Reparations. They have been taking the leadership in terms of building the bridges with the Muslim American community. And two years ago, it was an indelible picture in my mind now when I saw the Muslim Americans that came to the pilgrimage praying with the monument in the background framed by the Sierra Nevada mountains. That's the kind of sacred place and gathering place this is. When Victor and I had this idea, we came back to LA and talked to one of our older brothers about the idea. He probably thought we were a little crazy at that time, but he's the ultimate OG, not OG-san, but original gangster in the Asian American movement in Los Angeles. So when we talked about marching to Mansonar, he wasn't all for marching to Mansonar. But this is the way Mona Sheeta does stuff. <laughs> Mona Sheeta got people together to run to Manzanar. Not walk, not march, but they run to Manzanar. As an educational example, the kind of fortitude, perseverance, and commitment to justice that this individual has. Our brother, ladies and gentlemen, Mona Sheeta. these tall guys around here. <laughs> Just gotten shorter running off. <laughs> uh, again, my name is Mo Nishida. I am here as a representative of the 5500 Indigenous Elder Support Committee that uh, sponsors the 250-mile Little Tokyo to Manzanar Spiritual Unity and Prayer Run. And let me introduce some of our, our runners this year. This is our 28th Spirit Runner Circle, Alda, Tani, Linda, Misako, uh, Horizo, Danny, oh man, Camillo, they're over there raising their hand. Uh, and over there, something. Misako and Linda. Anyhow, all of us want to share our appreciation and our support for all the work that's being done here today. I mean, and, and, and to carry it on for 50 years, right? So that we can come here together today and say we have you know, coming together after 50 years. And I have to say, right, as a, as a Buddha head, man, doesn't it make you feel good that the Muslim sisters and brothers can be here, right, stand up and, and talk about, yeah, we have support from our community. You know, I, I think that's important, for, at least for me and my dignity you know, and my pride and who we are. I mean, you know. We gotta stand for something. You know what I mean? We gotta stand for dignity and equality. And uh, <laughs> I gotta get the done sign. Anyhow, uh, just to let all of you know, I am extremely proud to be a part of this assemblage today, as as I know that all of us runners are. And I want to thank each and every one of you for being there. All power to the people.
Real quickly, are there any people here that came to the first bands on our pilgrimage? Mo did, Jim Masoka did. Who's that raising their hand? How about your name, brother? Ron Wakabashi. Ron, is that you? Yep. All right, Ron. <laughs> also, I believe that Ken Levy is here. He came on the bus, 16 years old. Ken, are you here? He's still on the, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Lyndon, you can't. Lyndon came right on, brother. Good to see you again. All right, that's four. There's plenty of us still alive, believe me. <laughs> Let me introduce the chair of the Manzanar Committee, Bruce Emberg. Warren is always a tough act to follow, so unfortunately I have to follow him. But I have uh, two tasks today. One task I enjoy, and that is to recognize the contributions of one of our own. Um, that's Joyce Okazaki. Now Joyce, Joyce was here at Manzanar, and she's a little more famous than most because her photograph graces the cover of a book, Born Free and Equal, Ansel Adams photographs. But we honor Joyce not just because she was very photogenic and Ansel Adams took pictures of her. We honor Joyce because Joyce has been our educational and outreach director. And she has been instrumental in telling our story to thousands of people. And we wanted to recognize her for those contributions. And Joyce also is our treasurer, so she's really the most powerful person in the mass Because <laughs> she controls the checkbook. But seriously, we know many aspects of our story that are they're, they're more, they're told fairly often. The heroism of the veterans of the 4200th Battalion and the MIS. We know of the resistance, uh, the draft resistors in Heart Mountain. And we know the story and the, of the courage of the no-nos who uh, decided to take a stand against their illegal incarceration. So we generally know the key features, but Joyce's educational work takes us way back, and she explores the roots of the incarceration and the forced removal. Joyce's education work, her, her PowerPoint will take you all the way back to the 1800s when there was a Chinese Exclusion Act. So don't forget the first Exclusion Act was against the Chinese people. And then there was Exclusion Acts against the Japanese people. And now there's talk or there's an Exclusion Act against the Muslim people. And we, and Joyce is very clear and she explains how wrong all of this is. So for that, we want to honor Joyce Okazaki for all of her good work. Daryl Warren is the teachers who she spoke all her class. 2,000 of his students get to her, hear Joyce. Thank you very much. Uh, it's totally unexpected. I'm very, very honored to be awarded a, a, some kind of an award. I mean, really. <laughs> this is a complete surprise. They knew that if they told me in advance, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> this is my first time back after not being here for two years, so I really enjoy the uh, pilgrimage, and I hope you're all enjoying it, too. Thank you very much. Daryl Warren is the teacher. He's right over here by that speaker. He's a Quaker, and if you remember your history, it was the Quakers who actually supported the Japanese when they were being removed, forcibly removed from their from their homes so many years ago. And you know, today's pilgrimage, we honor and pay our respects to our elders. We celebrate the fact that we had resilience and the tenacity to last 50 years. And that's the nice part of the pilgrimage. But my other job today, unfortunately, is to draw the parallels of what is happening today with what happened to our families. And our pilgrimage today is taking place in the midst of challenging and in fact dangerous times. The current administration, the President of the United States, have manufactured a non-existent national emergency. They speak of an invasion, a so-called invasion, by people who come from other cultures. And this hysteria that emanates from the White House is being whipped up by white supremacist groups and being codified into xenophobic policies by our own government. Honestly, there is no difference from the actions of our government today and the actions of our government in 1942. 
Children are being separated from their families and placed in cages in our southern border. Just as in 1942, when our families were ripped apart and our OG sons were sent far away. For decades, no one spoke of the trauma of the forced removal or the incarceration of our families. No one spoke of the horrific injustices that the Nikkei community endured during World War II. But something changed 50 years ago when Warren, my mother, Jim, and Mo, and others came to Manzanar to discover and reflect on what happened here in 1942. Back in 1969, simply remembering what happened was an act of resistance. When they returned home, they decided that they had to do more than just venture, march, run, or walk to Manzanar to remember. They had to tell the world of what happened here. They decided that they had to make sure our country would remember so that what occurred to their families and our families would never happen again. Their journey to tell our story and to demand justice from our government helped to galvanize our community. The pilgrimages became a place to talk story and to confront what my mother called the monstrous and traumatic event. In fact, pilgrimages became a place to heal. The pilgrimages rapidly became a site for all justice-minded people to gather and to make demands for redress and reparations. There were calls for solidarity with others who suffered similar experiences, such as the occupation and wounded knee in 1973 when the Manzanar Committee sent a message of solidarity to the native brothers and sisters at Wounded Knee. There were calls for an end to the Vietnam War, and these calls echoed off the sands surrounding this lone cemetery monument. So the pilgrimages were more than just about Manzanar. They were and they are today a place where our community can gather to support those who are facing essentially the same struggles and the same persecutions that we had faced in 1942. This is important for us to think about because in 1942 no one stood up for our community. No one outside the Nikkei community demonstrated or protested the forced removal. There were no editorials, there were no protests, there were no vigils. No one stood on the floor of the Congress to say this is wrong. Today must be different. Today we must stand together against hate and not stand silent when white nationalists take to the streets of our cities. We cannot stand silent while armed vigilantes patrol our southern border. We must remember the Manzanar Committee declared 50 years ago that Manzanar should not just be a symbol of what is wrong with our nation, but that Manzanar should become a monument to our core values of democracy and civil rights. And today, we can honestly say, Manzanar is such a monument. Our message is simple. Speak out, demand equal justice under the law for everyone, no matter who they are or where they come from. Today, at the 50th anniversary of the Manzanar pilgrimage, we ask that you join us so that what happened here at Manzanar never happens again to anyone, anywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce, for connecting the dots and for your call to director of the Fred T. Korematsu Institute and the daughter of the late Fred T. Korematsu. In 2009, on the 25th anniversary of the reversal of Fred's World War II U.S. Supreme Court conviction, Karen established the Fred T. Korematsu Institute. Since her father's passing in 2005, Karen has carried on Fred's legacy as a civil rights advocate, public speaker, and public educator. We are very, very honored to have here, her here today. Please welcome Karen Korematsu. Good afternoon, pilgrims. Thank you, Bruce um, Embry and the Manzanar Committee for inviting me here today. Uh, thank you, Consul General Yuama, for your wonderful words. And to the national treasure here, Warren Fotani, where are you? Warren, in 2010, when he was in the California legislature, took on the legislative bill to establish Fred Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties in the Constitution on January 30th in perpetuity. 
And he did this working across the aisle and uh, in a nonpartisan manner and to make sure that what this day represents is, is, yes, it honors my father, but it's a reminder that we must uphold our Constitution and our civil liberties. Our democracy is at risk. Our democracy is on attack. And we need all of you to support us to make sure going forward that we make those changes. The Fred T. Korematsu Institute, for all of you teachers there, any teachers can go to our, our website um, and sign up for our curriculum toolkits free of charge. That's what we do for fundraising. So you have the materials necessary to teach in depth about the incarceration and how it relates to our civil liberties, national security, and racial profiling today. Um, the reason I'm, I'm here is, is not only to honor the 50th anniversary of the pilgrimage, but also it was my father's 100th birthday on January 30th. And we need to take those opportunities to bring our stories to light. Everyone has a story. And I want all of you afterwards to share your stories. When you go home, ask your family and friends what their stories are. Because once you understand your own story, you can appreciate other people's stories. And, and ignorance is, uh, prejudice is ignorance, and our ignorance is prejudice, and the only way to fight that is through education. <laughs> The way I learned about my father's Supreme Court case was when I was a, a junior in high school. Up until that time, till 16 years old, I knew nothing about my father's Supreme Court case. And I grew up in, in the San Francisco Bay Area in a little town called San Leandro. And I attended a high school with about 2,500 students. Um, there was only six Asian Americans in the entire population. And my social studies teacher had given us a, uh, all a different paperback book to read. And my friend Maya, her paperback book was called Concentration Camps USA. Wow, what a title that is. And then she goes on to talk about the Japanese American incarceration and that horrible period in time. And then she says, but there is this one man who resisted the military orders. And it ended up to be a landmark Supreme Court case called Korematsu versus United States. Oh, that's my name. <laughs> and I had 35 pairs of eyes turning around looking at me and I'm shrugging my shoulders thinking that's some black sheep of the family. <laughs> because she never said fret. And so, of course, I go running home and ask my mother, and, I, and she goes, <clears throat> yes, this is about your father. And then I get the other standard answer, you'll have to wait until he gets home to ask him. And my father not only had housing discrimination, he had employment di discrimination, worked two jobs, and by the time he, he got home, it was 8 o'clock at night. And then I asked him what had happened, you know, told him what happened that day in school, and he simply said, it happened a long time ago, and what he did he thought was right, and the government was wrong. That clear and simple. It wasn't complicated. And I could see this hurt going over his face, and it was like somebody punched me in the stomach. And I couldn't ask him any more questions about that period in time. But I did ask him if he could vote because voting was very important to my parents. So remember, we still have an obligation in this country to get out the vote because we need it now more, more than ever. Um, I'm gonna f f fast forward to 1983 to when my father's Supreme Court case was opened up and, and the Quorum Nobis legal team was established. And Dale Manami, who's going to speak after me, will tell you more about that. But until that time, I did not know that my father had never given up hope that someday he would be able to reopen up his Supreme Court case. Almost 40 years later, he never gave up hope. And in the face of adversity, he had tried to enlist in the military before, the Pearl, 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 before Pearl Harbor and was denied because he had a Japanese name. He, he did work in the shipyards um, uh, before Pearl Harbor. And then the day after, because it was a government um, industry, that he was fired. Just like a lot of Japanese and Japanese Americans were fired from their jobs if they were working for the government. But in, in 1942, 
no one wanted anything to do with my father. Now, I, he was up, born in Oakland and grew up in the Bay Area. So most people went to the Tan Ferran Detention Assembly Center, the horse stalls. As my father said, horse stalls are for horses, not for people, because they smell like manure, they, they was inhumane, in, 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 sorry, the, the conditions were inhumane, and the food was just, you know, obviously, as you, many of you know, was unedible. But he, he always, so he was there vilified from day one. No one wanted anything to do with my father because they thought some harm might come to them if they associated with him. So, but he never gave up hope to keep fighting his case. When his conviction was overturned in 1983, my dad could have very well said, hey, Japanese American community, you didn't want anything to do with me. Why should I have anything to do with you? But he wasn't like that. For most of you who knew him, Warren did, that, that he, he, he wanted to help the community. Wherever he was asked, he would show up and worked with the JECL and worked on redress and reparations because he didn't want something like the Japanese American incarceration to happen again. So in 1998, my father received the Presidential Medal of Freedom for all his work. And when he received these honors, he did so on behalf of his entire community. So his uh, 75th anniversary of Korematsu versus the United States, the Supreme Court case, is this year on December 18th. So we are trying to bring focus to what that means today. So that, and. And the dissenting opinions of that time were the most important. So in 1944, Justice Robert Jackson referred to my father's Supreme Court case as this lies around like a loaded weapon, ready for anyone to pick up and use with a plausible cause. And certainly over time, they've tried to do that. Justice Frank Murphy called it the ugly abyss of racism. Justice Owen Roberts said it was unconstitutional. Constitutional rights have been violated. So then we're going to fast forward to January 27th, 2017, when this current president issued his first executive order banning Muslims from this country. Um, on, on January 30th of that year, three days later, some of you remember, the Google Doodle appeared of my father. And my phone starts lighting up with all these messages. And then I was told, even though my father received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, when you receive a Google Doodle, you've made it. <laughs> but as you know, the, the, the journey of this Trump versus Hawaii was a long one. It was bounced around with the Court of Appeals. Then it became 2.0, the immigration ban. Then 3.0, the travel ban. And so this is what the government does. Right? They try to water down the significance of the impact of what they're trying to do, just like they did in 1942. So in, on June 26th of last year, the Supreme Court uh, came up with their decision. It was a majority opinion to uphold the Muslim travel ban. So Justice Sotomayor, however, went for the juggler and wrote this scathing dissent. And if you have a chance to read it, please do. She said, by, blinding, ex except, by blindly accepting the majority p opinion, all in the name of national security, the court redeploys the same dangerous logic underlining Korematsu and merely, merely replacing one, sorry, uh, gravely wrong uh, decision with another. Then I wrote my op-ed for the New York Times where I said all the Supreme Court did was replace one injustice for another. So here we are, and I want you to ask yourself, what does it mean to be an American? What does an American look like? Now I can tell you being an American means to uphold citizens and non-citizens. We need to stop the hate the racism, xenophobia, and this racial and religious profiling. Remember, the, the executive branch we cannot depend on. Now, the judicial branch we cannot depend on. The legislative branch is our only hope. And so I encourage you to get out there and support civic engagement and support those who uh, want to run for office. We cannot be complacent. And remember what my father said. 
Stand up for what is right. When you see something wrong, protest, but not with violence. Otherwise, they won't listen to you. But don't be af afraid to speak up. Thank you. This animal pilgrimage. I am honored to be this place with all of you, part of the representative of beautiful spiritual rising. My name is Ken Koshio and this is my son Miro. How come I'm here? Because one day, 2001, before 9-11 happened, the founder of the Manzaner Committee, Sue Kunitome Embry, found me in Little Tokyo in, a, in front of the water fountain of the Tokyo Village Plaza. And I was singing on the street. Keep on playing, man. <laughs> so anyways, and uh, I was <clears throat> playing and then she came. I really love your music. Could you help our activity in it? Can you sing for us? Sure. <laughs> she took my hands and going to the Cairo place. And then committee people and people are together to do fundraising for this committee. So I sang Skiaki and my tune. So Susan is not here physically, but if I didn't meet her, of course I didn't come here today. And then also 9-11 happened. I was born and raised in Japan. Back in 1998, I came to Los Angeles to be a rock star. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, being a street singer. And uh, the lady, she's been doing great MC, Tracy Katokiriyama, also found me. And I, she asked me to play for the Tuesday Night Cafe. So if you're not familiar with those kind of local history, back 2000, I was one of the people in Los Angeles. So after 9-11 happened, I went to Grand Zero, New York from LA to, uh, you know, Chicago on Route 66. This Japanese happy court said Hiroshima Taiko Hosonkai. I was born and raised in Nagoya, Japan, but my Taiko, I've been playing Taiko for a long time. My sensei is one of the survivors of Hiroshima bombing. And I've been learning a lot of things from him and also Taiko Tun. And uh, one of these victims in the whole world, it's not just Japan, it's not just the US, all around the world, we know language varies, different kind of a way of the understanding of the things. But I want to believe our roots is here on the Mother Earth. And then since I moved to the uh, to Phoenix, Arizona, right now I live in Phoenix, Arizona, I've been playing a lot of Native American people. So, anyways, after 9/11, I went to Grand Zero, New York. After August 6 of the Hiroshima bombing day, I left Los Angeles, Santa Monica Beach, and then reached to nine uh, Grand Zero, New York, 2002, 9/11, with 10,000 Oregon cranes. So in front of us, little cranes. But I still believe, our believing is gonna make something special. So I wanna dedicate this cere you know, celebrating, cere cere celebration, and then also I wanna dedicate for the whole new generations, keep on, how can we be together?
way back to Los Angeles after 9-11, I went to New York. I stopped to Sedona and I made my son <laughs> back 2002. And he is now 15. He was born July 10th in 2003 in Sedona. So anyways, I believe this is our real passing something important to generation to generations. pleasure to introduce the next keynote speaker. I know that it's getting a little warm out there, but you really have to listen to this person. He's not only a, a fellow guardian, a person like myself, so he's a homeboy. 
but also he's been involved in things you might know that he's a nationally and internationally known as a leading defense attorney in the legal world. But we know him because of his relentless work in the legal arena, in the political arena, in the activist arena around not only this issue, but many issues related to the Asian Pacific Islander American community and the community at large. He is the leading civil rights attorney in California, in my opinion. And when we get a chance, and I know there's some discussion about whether Korematsu versus the United States is overturned, if we ever go before the Supreme Court representing the community for civil rights Japanese Americans and all of you here is going to be attorney Dale Manami. He's going to be backed up by his law partner Don Tamaki and the other attorneys that help with the Quorum Nobis case, ladies and gentlemen, someone we have deep respect for, deep appreciation for his years of work, attorney Dale Manami. Um, this is an amazing day. I'm so thrilled to be here and you know you look around and see this wonderful environment uh, and all the people here supporting the 50th uh, commemoration of the Man Manzanar pilgrimage and yet it belies the tragedy, the justice uh, travesty that occurred and the difficult conditions Japanese Americans lived on, lived with. You know, I want to thank the Forest Service and the Manzanar Committee for inviting me. It's really an opportunity, a special opportunity to come back here to Manzanar. I grew up in Gardena, like Warren said, and every summer we'd go trout fishing. We'd go up 395 from uh, Lone Pine up to Bishop, fish, and we'd pass by Manzanar uh, all the time. But we never knew what it was. We even didn't know what it represented. And it wasn't until Warren and Victor found this place and were able to were able to start the whole pilgrimage that we understand the true significance of this remarkable place because Manzanar has a lot of meaning for us it's not just a reminder of the past or a lesson for the future it's an inspiration to us and it leaves us with a legacy there is no more timely journey than to come here at this place at this time when our country is under attack as all the other speakers have talked about and as we remember Manzanar I'd also just this song has been going through my head you know good friends we have good friends we've lost along the way in this great future you can't forget your past it's from Bob Marley and I just want to recognize some of those we've lost Sue Embry and one of my friends, Aiko Yoshinaga Herzig, and many others. I consider Manzanar as one of the bookends of Japanese American history. It represents the incarceration of 120,000 Americans of Japanese ancestry, two thirds of whom were American citizens. Uh, the young, the old, the infirm, the disabled. It represents financial disasters, lost and destroyed careers. Uh, people, people who were not able to even be, uh, have adequate food or medical care, uh, dusty barracks, uh, two, two crowded barracks, the long lines just to go to the latrines or the bathrooms, and and perhaps the greatest danger or damage to Japanese Americans was the loss of dignity, the loss of hope, the lo the abject humiliation because of the injustice of these incarceration. And you can remember being branded as spies, as saboteurs, as traitors to a country that you loved. And our crime, racial ancestry, justification was military necessity, or you call it national security. Manzanar reminds us that those justifications were absolute lies. And when we filed our petitions to overturn the convictions of Fred Korematsu, Gordon Hirabayashi, and Minyasui in 1983 with evidence that was discovered, official documents that contradicted exactly what the government was claiming, that Japanese Americans are disloyal, 
that they were a danger, that they were committing acts of espionage, and the real reason for the incarceration was we simply didn't have time to separate the loyal from the disloyal. The documents discovered proved that those were intentional falsehoods. Intentional falsehoods, as the government's own attorneys said. Unfortunately, all that evidence was suppressed, it was altered, it was hidden from the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court in 1943 and 44 upheld the incarceration, the inter, 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 incarceration uh, program, and we were left with one of the greatest civil disasters in American history. Uh, Manzanar and Redress also represent the other bookend of history, and that is the inspired journey Japanese Americans took to gain re political redemption, to gain psychological redemption for the, for the terrible injustices they suffered and endured. Uh, redress was an inspired journey uh, to reclaim our political birthright. And uh, just a side note, as I thought about Manzanar, what it represent, and, it, and the finding of Manzanar in 1965, it, it occurred to me that this was the genesis of what Warren and Victor and Sue Embry and others have done to activate Japanese Americans. It was before redress, before day, uh, Days of Remembrances, before Farewell to Manzanar, all of those. Manzanar set in motion a national consciousness and a national education to have people learn about the entire incarceration experience and, and the devastating effects it had on our communities. I think what Manzanar also represents as a lesson, and an important lesson in political power. Bruce mentioned it before, because if you remember, in 1942, Japanese Americans had no allies. The Quakers were one of the few groups to stand up. No other national group stood beside Japanese Americans. We were alone. And as a result, we suffered that civil rights travesty. But in 1988, on that inspired journey to redress, Japanese Americans uh, uh, in in, uh, brought in all, all races, a rainbow coalition of people, allies, to wield the political power to pass the redress bill. So that's the lesson, I think, of another lesson of Manzanar. And when we emerged from the dark prisons into the sunlight we, of freedom, we found a voice. We regained that voice, and we were able to have a legacy, a responsibility, to speak out against injustice in the future. So Manzanar is a warning. It's an echo of history. It's a stark reminder of what unbridled power and racism can wreak on a democracy. Uh, and that's just what's happening today. When you see the vicious attacks against Mexicans, Central Americans, Muslims and Arabs, when you see the demonization of marginalized group, LGBT and transgender community, the poor, the disabled, the attacks on the election system, the attacks on the press, uh, and especially the focus on immigrants. And all of us have come from an immigrant past. Everyone just about has. And so that it's important for us to fight this war because it's a war for the soul of this country. Will we be a country that embraces diversity and uh, as a natural part of the multicultural fabric? Or will we be a country where white supremacy uh, succeeds and triumphs with its ethnic, religious, and racial cleansing that Trump is essentially proposing. So it's up to us to stand up for those principles. And the lesson of Manzar is one of those lessons. You know, I talk about history a lot, and history is important to me because uh, it's important to remember not just what happened, but to act upon it. And I think of history as climbing up a mountain. From halfway up the mountain, you could look back and you could see the struggles of your immigrant ancestors, the hardships they faced coming to a hostile country. You could see the civil rights path blazed by African Americans, by Latinx, by Native Americans. But also from halfway in that vantage point up the mountain, you could look up and you could see how much farther we have to go to reach an egalitarian society, the equality that Martin Luther King Jr. spoke about. But knowledge of history is not alone is not enough. There are so many noble ideas and brilliant thoughts that die lonesome deaths. If you don't couple history and the knowledge of history with some action 
that makes a difference, you've achieved nothing. So it's important for us to know that, to know not only the history, but then to act upon that history. So the legacy of Manzanar and redress is not the $20,000, it's not the apology or the Civil Liberties Public Education Fund. The legacy is a responsibility to speak out and stand up against injustice. We know that justice is not self-executing. We know that civil rights are not a gift, they are a challenge. So we must act to change the present now or it becomes the future. And I know many of us are discouraged. I get really down sometime in these days, but I don't think we could ever give up because we have to remember the legacy of the Nisei veterans, of the Korematsu Hirobayashi Yasui, of the Heart Mountain resistors. They never gave up. They were in prison or fighting on different battlefields to preserve this country at a time when their ebbs and uh, their uh, fortunes were at their lowest. So we could never give up. And if you ever find, a, if you find a meaning in Manzanar as we can see it, you could feel it, you could hear that meaning. And to me, it's simple, it's just this. It's never again, never again, never again. Thank you. Let's hear it again, Dale Minami. All right, we are coming towards the, the latter part of the program. Um, this is a, a, a wonderful honor to present a very important award. It is called the Sue Kunitomi Embry Legacy Award. And just as Dale talked about the people who blaze trails, this person who's the recipient of the award this year, somebody who is a living legacy, uh, like so many of the big sisters and cousins who are here today who have really blazed a trail. Um, I am so uh, lucky, I feel, to know this person and to learn from this guy. He's somebody who is um, sometimes brash, really blunt, um, comes from a long history of organizing with workers, was an early member of Nikkei for Civil Rights and Redress for um, many years and still is to this day very active with NCRR. He is a writer, a storyteller. Um, I just have to share a, a quick anecdote. I got to work on a show earlier this year called Tales of Clamor and Yay! it is a show, you. Yeah. Uh, I got to work on that with JCCC and with NCRR as partners, and um, it's a really a, a, a story about silence and noise. And in it, we utilize video footage from the LA Commission hearings uh, in 1981 that led to redress. And it was testimonies that were very, very powerful. And we knew that we had to have this one part shown out of over 26 hours. We could only have a few minutes of an edit in this show. But there was a guy who was uh, about to speak and the commissioners at the hearings were getting tired and they were asking the people who spoke Japanese to turn in their testimonies and not speak out loud. They were asking people to hurry up. And that was a mistake because they said this right before this guy came up. And he said, I will not be hurried by you. I will not be hurried by you as a representative of this government ever. And he slammed the table. And you can see all the people like jump. And when we showed that, and we had conversations after the show, and we were able to point to the guy who's still around who did that, people were like, what? He was such a rock star. Nobody wanted to meet us. They all wanted to meet this guy after the show. And so it should be, our community heroes, the ones that leave us a legacy. And it is so great and wonderful to honor this person. Let's, let's hear it now for Jim Matsuoka. I thought I was going to get a, a wave or something like that. <laughs> I really came all the way out here to honor Sue Embry. Sue Embry and I go back a long ways. We were both members of the uh, JACL, uh, uh, Progressive West Side Chapter. And at that time, the big issue was the grape strike. And of course, we wanted to, the JACL to support uh, Cesar Chavez and, and the Grape Strike workers. 
uh, Central California, which was run by the Nisei Farm Workers League and Harry Kubo, was adamantly against that. So we had this situation where the, the JACL was almost going to split in half. But Sue was very adamant about it, and we got most of the uh, Southern California chapters to go along with supporting the, way, the grape strikers, but uh, we never really fully managed to get all of the JCL on board. Many years later, I had an opportunity to meet Cesar Chavez, and that happened because I was working at Cal State Long Beach, and it was Friday night, it was, it was well, Friday afternoon, and, and the campus was pretty empty, you know. But uh, members of the La Raza students came to me and they said, uh, uh, we have uh, Cesar Chavez coming on and he's gonna be at the Oak Room and all the big wigs are gone, so we're gonna have to ask you to go over there. So, being a small, small little nothing, I said, oh, that's fine, you know, it's, it's a great honor. And I got in line and uh, when I finally got to the front of it, I said, uh, Mr. Chavez, it's a great pleasure and honor to meet you. And I told him about what Sue and I had done and the fact that I sat and watched all of the debates between him and Harry Kubo. And uh, when I was finished with that, you know, uh, Cesar Chavez really lit up. And he said, you know something, uh, you said it was uh, an honor to meet me. He says, well, I." I think it's an honor to meet you. And I, sh I sure wish uh, Sue Embry was here so that sh I could share that story with her. You know, we, back in 1969, we came all the way out this way to remember what our people suffered and to not forget. And we learned that the pilgrimage, essentially, is what you and I want to make of it, you know? and. A question was put to me a few years back when I was speaking and urging people at the Corona Mosque to go on the pilgrimage. Somebody asked me, what do I get out of it? And I said, well, at that time, I said, you can only search within yourself to see what you stand for. But I think things have changed a lot. I think now we need to see man's and the man's in our pilgrimage almost as a voice for unity. We need to unite because we need to get together with all of us who give a damn about the direction of this country and where it's headed. I think with all of you, so many of you headed today, we can forge a new spirit for America. We need to really speak up. You know, we need to, we need to speak up for the people who aren't the 1%, and that means me. You know, and that means most of you, because no, you ain't making that kind of money. We need, we need to speak up for people who have to have two jobs just to make the rent. We need to speak up for those who have a serious illness, and that means the end of your American dream. Let me tell you something, our health system sucks. Yeah. You don't believe that, just, just, just wait around and see what happens. We need to speak up to, for renters who have nothing left except hunger. And we need to speak up for students who are going to have nothing left when they pay for their education many, many years from now. And we also need to speak up for the elderly whose Social Security checks leave them in stark poverty. Also for the single parent who also bequeaths a lifetime of want for their children. And I ask you, what sort of society is that? I think we need to start, we need to start somewhere and we need to start with a spirit, not so much of hate and division, but one of inclusion. We all need to be brothers and sisters with each other. And as, I've, as I have told my friends, at the Corona Mosque, no one can tell you to go back where you came from because you are already home. This place belongs to all of us, all of us. And we reject the call of those people who call, call for exclusion 
and those idiots that want to build a bigger wall. You know, if anything doesn't get you fuming, that should do it. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming today, and I hope as you look to the right and left of you, you see a brother or a sister. And as I say, when you, when you see me, you might say, hey, Jim, it was a great pleasure to meet you. And I'll say, just like Cesar Chavez said, it's a great, no, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to meet you. So there we have it. Thank you so much for the Mazar Committee. To all of you who are here, my brothers and sisters, may peace be with you. And, and make sure that we don't forget and make sure that we keep bringing people together and bridge communities and fight for, for justice in our future. So I'm just going to ask us to say hi, Sue, on the count of three. One, two, three. Hi, Sue! We thank her so much. All right. What is the future without the youth? And we are so excited to have a student-run program that happens later today called Manzanar After Dark. And uh, with us here today from the UCSD Nikkei Student Union is Lauren Matsumoto. Thank you everyone, it's a great honor to be here at the 50th annual Manzanar Pilgrimage and for everyone to still continue to be here after a very long and hot day. As mentioned, I am with the UC uh, San Diego Nikkei Student Union as their co-president as well as one of the student organizers of Manzanar at dusk. We all take part in the Manzanar Pilgrimage for various reasons. Some of us are here to learn about the truth and history that we are seldom taught in class. Some of us are here to reconnect and to remember a family history. Family history that maybe readily was discussed or for some of us seldom talked about or not at all. And some of us are revisiting a past, a part of your life that was behind barbed wires. I would fall into the category of remembering and reconnecting with my family history. And I have my dad, Barney Matsumoto, to thank for being the first to share this knowledge with me of the incarcerations of my grandparents. My grandfather, Bob Matsumoto, was sent to Tule Lake, and my grandmother, Jane Adachi, was sent to Gila River. And it was also my dad who took me on my first Manzanar pilgrimage, and it's a great honor. When we come to Manzanar, there is always some kind of discussion occurring, whether silently with the land, or through conversations with the people that we came with, or the new friends that we made along the way. And a, an important thought that we all think about, and is very prominent in our mind, is how could this happen? And I can list all of the reasons why that I've learned over the years, but I think one that is very important that we highlight today, and something that we need to change, is during, in 1942, the Japanese American community didn't have strong allies that can stand up with us and speak against what was happening. And since then, we have seen history repeating itself. And as we stand here on land that was once behind barbed wires, there are other communities still with the, behind barbed wired fences. Some of them are immigrants currently placed in detention centers. There are replicas of these concentration camps that we said would never happen again. So let's have those discussions, but let's also take action. And there are many ways this can happen. Be an active participant in your community. Be a registered voter and go to those polls and elect those officials that will vote for things that you want. And as well, support projects like Katari, a trip organized by the Manzanar Committee and the Manzanar National Historic Site that focuses on educating the next generation of student leaders. If you're interested in continuing this discussion after the Manzanar pilgrimage, we invite everyone to join us at Manzanar Dust, organized by the Nikkei Student Unions of UC San Diego, UC Los Angeles, Cal Poly Pomona, Cal State Long Beach, and Cal State Fullerton, along with the Manzanar Committee. We invite everyone, and it will be held at 5 p.m. at Lone Pine High School. Those who have joined us will be given the space. 
to reflect on their time here at the Manzanar pilgrimage, as well as tell their own stories. Everyone from all ages and backgrounds are welcomed, and we especially encourage former Nikkei and Karsiris and their families to join us to share their stories. Thank, uh, we hope to see everyone there at 5 p.m. Lone Pine High School. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren. And having the younger generation, it's always been a part of the work of the Manzanar Committee. And the Manzanar Committee has a student awards program. So we'd like to bring up here to acknowledge her representing the four recipients of the award this year. Camille Arriano, Sarah Omura, Christopher Garcia, and Katharina Garcia. If Sarah could come up, please. A big round of applause for Sarah. Do you want to say a few words? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Let me call up Tracy for some final words. Tracy, great job today. Let me give you the mic. Thanks, Warren. All right, we're here. We're, we're there. We're, we're at the uh, procession, the last procession. Um, uh, just my last words are, I wanted to offer up just an, a little interaction. So I want you to just make eye contact with someone that you're near. And I want you to just say, I see you. I stand with you. I see you. I stand with you. Do it again. I see you. I stand with you. One more time. I see you. I stand with you. If you did not get to all three, you're going to do that at some point today. But thank you so much uh, for the honor of sharing the stage. And uh, enjoy the day. Please hydrate. And we'll bring back Warren. A couple of months ago in Crystal City, Texas, a group of Japanese Americans and friends went on pilgrimage to a Department of Justice detention center the Japanese were put in during World War II. Within the first 24 hours, 48 hours of the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the FBI and other agencies went into the Japanese American community, arrested Japanese community leaders, and they were sent to different parts of the country, none of the camps like Manzanar. So at this pilgrimage a couple of months ago, a group came there because 40 miles away is a family detention center where immigrants, undocumented immigrants, are being put in, separated from their children, and it's being run by a private prison company. So the issues related to what's going on in the past and history are still happening today. As the presidential election unfolds for 2020, one of the issues being put four square on the table for discussion, debate, and I'm sure argument is reparations and looking at the impact of slavery on the African American community. When you look at the issues of reparations provided by the federal government of the United States, they've only do it to two groups. Sioux Indians because their land was taken from them, and the other group was Japanese Americans fighting for redress and reparations. So as this debate unfolds, don't be surprised if the African American community comes to our community to talk about how we did it. So we could share with them different ideas, different ways it was done, because their cause is our cause. Because what is indelibly in my mind, looking at the Muslim American community, coming here today as our sisters and brothers, looking at all of you here today, coming to the sacred ground, to the 50th Manzanar pilgrimage, to celebrate the perseverance, the creativity, the fundamental strength of our community, and those that lived here for four years, and those that are still bodied here. We thank you for coming to the 50th anniversary of the Manzanar pilgrimage. Could we have Monica Embry come forward to do the procession at the cemetery? Monica? Oh! <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming here today. My name is Monica Embry. And I'm Michael Embry. And we're Sue's grandchildren. So I'm going to ask if this path can be cleared for the banner procession. Following the banner procession, we invite all of you to join us here in the cemetery for an interfaith service and offering. 
After that, in the back of the tent, we will have ondo dancing. And for any survivors of any of the camps who are here, we invite you to the monument for a photo after dance. This is the banner procession and the camp roll call. Amache, Colorado, 7,318. Crystal Lake, or Crystal City, Texas, 2,200. Gila River, Arizona, 13,348. Heart Mountain, Wyoming, 10,767. Jerome, Arkansas, 8,497. Manzanar, California, 10,046. Minadoka, Idaho, 9,397. Poston, Arizona, 17,814. Rower, Arkansas, 8,475. Topaz, Utah, 8,130. Tule Lake, California, 18,789. And the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, 100th Infantry Battalion and MIS, 33,000 servicemen and women. It's an honor to be here and continue our grandmother's legacy. Please join us in the cemetery, and thank you.